uh, some of the title slide is not coming, so we'll just skip that. So vitrectomy uh, in infectious endophthalmitis. So we have very clear guidelines from the EVS, and these are the classical guidelines that if vision is hand movements or better, vitrectomy is no better than a tap. If vision is PL only, then there's a much better chance of getting good vision if you do an early vitrectomy. And in diabetic patients, there's a trend that we should do early vitrectomy, and that uh, reason leads to better visual results. So what are the aims of vitrectomy and endophthalmitis? Traditionally, we used to do a co-vitrectomy and inject intravital antibiotics. It helps to reduce the microbial load, reduce endo and exotoxins, and the inflammatory cells. And it helps to get adequate sample for the lab testing, as Dr. Uh, Sangeet also just showed us. So classically, there are two different approaches. This is a little bit controversial, but uh, there's a limited approach where we, which we generally follow in non-fulment cases which have attached retina and a complete approach, which we follow in our, our setup in fulminant cases, especially which have a super added retinal detachment or a choroidal detachment. In the limited vitrectomy, normally it's lens sparing. That is, you don't do a lensectomy, you don't remove the IOL. It's a minimalistic approach. You do a core vitrectomy only, and you don't go really after the PVD. Whereas in a complete vitrectomy, we may need to remove the lens or IOL, do a total vit uh, vitrectomy, we do a PVD in induction, do base excision, and these are the cases where we may use silicon oil. So this was a pu uh, publication of ours in the European Journal of Ophthalmology some time ago, where we talked about using hybrid 2023. I think Dr. Mohit Dogra also just spoke about hybrid vitrectomy. This was, of course, some time ago. But in some of these very, very uh, uh, severe cases of endophthalmitis and trauma, we found that the 20 gauge cannula, a sutured one, was easier to see through the fibrin, exudates, hemorrhages, etc., and less chance of slippage or going into the supracoral or subretinal space in cases with a retinal detachment. Plus, we had an added advantage of the active cutter being 23 or 25 gauge, and this enhanced the safety and efficacy. What about the role of silicon oil? The role is controversial. We found it to be a useful case in fulminant cases, and uh, especially cases where you have end off with RD, or where you have micro breaks in the PVD in the necrotic retina, hidden breaks at the base, or patients who have recurrent infections. So very interesting is that oil has been known to have antimicrobial act activity against bacteria and fungi. And this has been found by various authors. So they have suggested that oil tamponade should be considered when the clinical features of previous exams suggest multidrug resistant organism or a fungal etiology. So this is a recent publication from Dr. Dave and uh, Dr. Uh, T.P. Das. And they've also found that medical grade silicon oil does supplement the antimicrobial effect of antibiotics in the management of endophthalmitis. So this is another thing we can think of when we are faced with very fulminant infectious endophthalmitis. So I think now everyone has gone to sleep after the coffee, so let's make, start, make it a little interesting. I'll just show two cases now. One is an anterior segment case. I'd like everyone's opinion on that and a posterior segment case. So this is a very uh, s frightening patient because he was a 30, the patient was not frightening, but the disease was. He was 32 year old young man. He had had bilateral ICL done two days ago uh, at another center, and he came with bilateral endophthalmitis. His vision was PL positive in both eyes. The, if you see the cornea, it doesn't look so bad in the photo, but he had a corneal abscess, and our cornea colleagues were very clear that I, we should not be touching the cornea. It, we diagnosed it clinically as bilateral pseudomonas, and you can see the uh, surgery now. So th this was a case where, so basically first we did, we, it was very severe. So we are clear we have to do a lensectomy. We did a lensectomy. And then we found a lot of the muck was around this ICL. And you can see this fibrinous, the exudates around the I ICL. We're trying to mobilize it. And we're wondering how do we remove this ICL? Because without ICL removed, you could see the view is so bad. At the back, we could hardly see anything. So this is why we thought out of the box. And now you can see a 20 gauge we made us another sclerotomy, and we're using what we used to olden days, the 19-gauge IOFB forceps. And I don't know whether anyone else would recommend this or has tried this, but we removed the ICL through this port so that we didn't have to touch the cornea. After this, of course, the view became better. You can see the optic disc, etc. And... Um, So this was sent, of course, we sent the sample as described. Uh, uh, because this patient had received intravitreal antibiotics before, I think their culture was negative. 
but uh, PCR for Ubactrium was uh, positive and the DNA sequencing done at Shankar Netral HNA revealed uh, Pseudomonas species. So fortunately he had a relatively happy outcome and uh, you can see the infection is clear and now after six months he's six six in uh, right eye and six nine in left eye with the early cataract in the eye which we did not do lensectomy. So that was one anterior segment. Now if we have a gift of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic coming up. There was a situation since this was a uveitis IC. I said let's bring some the flavor of uveitis into this. So there are some patients who presented to us with severe inflammation diagnosed by primary ophthalmologists as severe vitritis and uh, this is what we found. So I'll just one representative case. This is a 65 year old lady. She was in the ICU three weeks. She had the works. Everything was given to her. Steroids, remdesivir, etc. She developed floaters. Primary ophthalmologists initially diagnosed her as non-infectious uveitis and stuffed her with even more steroids and she came to us with a retinal detachment. You can see the retinal folds here. Inferiorly you can see this abscess and her vision was only perception of light in this eye. So we just quickly move on to the video. So here you can see we are removing all these um, f uh, fluffy white uh, exudates in the vitreous cavity and here you can see we've gone into the abscess and this is what we did with the technique shown to us by Dr. Sangeet also we took uh, we connected the tube uh, the syringe to that and not in the innovative way he showed but the traditional way and we got a sample uh, to send to our laboratory there were lots of membranes also so you can see we're doing a little bit of bimanual with the light pipe and the forceps to remove this area in superior nasal was the, where this was maximum and of course, this patient, because it had a RD and this fulminant infection, it needed a uh, silicon oil tamponade. We did laser also 360. You can see the 360 laser. And this is the most shocking part of the case. When we were closing, the fellow said, sir, look at this white, white stuff coming out. So I was wondering, is this fungus coming out in the episcleral space? So I said, let's just take this sample and send it to the lab. And I didn't know what was going on. I was wondering whether this was from the abscess area. But the abscess area, if you remember, was inferiorly at 6 o'clock. And this white stuff was coming out from the superior, superior aspect. So, yeah, so I think the audience has guessed it. The candida was isolated from the vitreous aspirate and the budding yeast were noted. So this was what came from inside. But outside we did a, this was a beautiful crystalline, crystals of triamcinone acetonide. So this is this fungal end of patient stuffed with more steroids and causing this sort of interesting appearance. Patient did uh, quite uh, relatively well post-op. Of course, the patient is not happy with 636 patient. She wants more, but the retina is attached and stable. So this was our series of, uh, and all these patients required a intervention, surgical intervention of endogenous fungal end of uh, following intensive corticosteroid and severe COVID. And uh, interesting is that vision loss in our patient was gradual, which very slow. So they did not consult doctors and vitritis has been reported in COVID. So ophthalmologists were stuffing these with steroids. And we should have a high uh, index of suspicion. And this is an infographic. If anyone would like this, I could, they can contact me. I'd be happy to email to this to them. So just the last slide now to summarize. So we have discussed the two approaches of vitrectomy and end of, the aggressive and the non-aggressive. We've spoken about hybrid vitrectomy for fulminant end of. We've just touched upon the role of end of, uh, of oil in endothelmitis. And we've discussed a few of these interesting post-COVID endothelmitis we need to still look out for. Uh, the golden dictum, however, remains that all unexpected uh, inflammation post-operatively should be considered infective until proven otherwise. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Cyrus. Wonderful talk. Unfortunately, we are slightly behind schedule, so we'll move on to uh, Manisha's talk. And by the time uh, her laptop is getting ready, can you tell uh, a question? Guidelines are roughly, you know, they are just indicative Thirty things. Years old, sir. Yeah. At least. But you have to take a call as per the case comes in. I mean, if you know that the person is getting worse, you are not going to wait for it to become hand movements and then intervene. PL positive, sir. Yeah. EVS says yes. PL positive. Yeah. So, like, like I said, we have to take a call as per every case. Guidelines are generally meant to be, I mean, you cannot be very strict about that. Typically in endophthalmitis, where it, uh, the eye is at stake. Uh, that's Secondly, the EVS is only for post cataract, be it uh, the primary IOL or the secondary IOL. Uh, can we extrapolate the uh, the recommendations of the EVS for uh, post traumatic and others? No, I really don't think so.
definitely different. Definitely post injection also. Post injection is very much different because actually we are inoculating the organisms. If we are the if our system is uh, infected, we are actually inoculating it directly into the nucleus. So what you are saying is very right, and Dr. Muna would like to add something on that. Yeah, when you said the EBS guidelines were 30 years old, yes, I agree they were 30 years old. There are a few good points of EBS that uh, intravitreal antibiotics work best, and I think most of us still would rely on these traditional intravitreal antibiotics rather than the fancy ones. They we reserve them for resistant cases. I think what would have changed more is the role of systemic antibiotics because when EBS was there, the role of system intraocular penetration of systemic antibiotics was different, at least the ones they studied. So I think that is one major area where we have changed as far as our profile of organism and the role of systemic antibiotics. Even a simple ciprofloxacin oral tablet has very good ocular penetration. So I think in that sense, yes, we have to evolve, but there are still good points in EVS which we need to continue. Oxacin was not, that time it was not available for them and now they found such a good uh, uh, penetration so we routinely give moxifloxacin 400 milligram BD to our cases, that's what ma'am said because that has got a good penetration intraocular.